Hi, good afternoon. My name is Carol Shaw, and I am um, a researcher at Virginia Commonwealth University with Paul Wayman, who has stepped out for the moment. Um, he's one of the organizers, the scientific panel for this event. It is my great pleasure to um, facilitate this panel of voices as we listen to families as they navigate the um, the the transition system. Um, as we begin, just to save a little time, I'll have each of the members of the panel introduce themselves, but we have a very brief description of their children, and in many ways, um, Arun, when he was um, organizing this panel, actually thought very mindfully about the cross-section. And as you can see, um, Jack Hewitt is on my uh, left here, your right, and Jack's son is 15 years old, so he's at the beginning of the... Um, mountain, looking up that mountain and trying to figure out how do I do this. Jack also comes with uh, professional experience as a VR professional. And then we have Ted, whose son Philip is 19 years. Ted Crum um, comes to us and he's right in the thick of it. He's really confronting all of those questions about what next and next is very soon. And then we have Denise Resnick, whose son Matt is 28 years old. And Denise will talk about her perspective kind of on the other side of the mountain. Um, in order to prepare, as this morning's panel did, I did share questions in advance with each of our panelists for them to think about and consider. And um, so they have notes, they have note cards, they have PowerPoints of their own. Um, and so I'm gonna begin, Jack, with the first question and then we'll just pass it down the line kind of in order of your child's age. Um, the first question was, what goals do you hope and aspire for your child to reach as they transition to adulthood? In a perfect world, where would your child live, work, and how would they interact with their community for fun and volunteering? Well, thank, thank you very much for So thank you very much for, uh, for having me, and thank you to Autism Speaks for the invitation. Um, I looked at this, and I thought a lot about how I look at, at Ryan, and, and what I focused on was more of a business model and the mission statement of a business, because a good business has a good mission statement, and they stay focused on that mission statement. And so I just want to share with you Autism Speaks' mission statement is promoting the solutions across spectrum and throughout life and to increase the understanding and acceptance. And, and the reason why I share that is that's not a quick goal. That's not a quick fix. That's gonna take a long journey. And Ryan's is the same way. Ryan's is to live independently, work in a career, be a contributing member of society, and to be happy. And just like Autism Speaks, what, what I'm doing, and Jennifer and I, my wife, is we're developing short-term goals that we can manage and that we can control that are moving Ryan forward to our mission statement. And so that's kind of how I use mine. Go ahead, Ted. Sure, thanks. So um, you know, our, our goals for Philip, uh, we take it one step at a time. Uh, our our long-term goals have to be fluid because we take one step at a time. We look around, we see you know what's worked, what might be possible for him given what we've learned, and 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 then we uh, we carry on and adjust uh, from there. But uh, over the over the long stretch, I, we're looking for uh, you know we want him to be able to live as safely and as independently as possible in a setting that is you know, some, maybe somewhere between a supported apartment or a group home uh, with a group of housemates that can provide him with some social interaction. Uh, we would like to see him in supported employment. And uh, because uh, Philip is, it also has epilepsy, as I think somewhere between 30 and 40% of our kids do, um, you know, we would like that to be in a setting where there is, you know, ready access to medical attentions, and we're willing to think creatively about that. It could be not just a hospital or a doctor's office, but it could be, um, you know, a, a lab, uh, a factory where there's a, where there is a, a medical officer on site. It could be a military base, a firehouse, you know, wherever you might uh, find that kind of attention. Um, 
We want them to have a network of guardians and friends and advisors who are going to watch out for him and keep his best interests uh, at heart. Um, we, uh, it's important to us that he be able to participate in um, actively in a, in a church community where he will always be welcome and have opportunities to, uh, to contribute and to socialize there. We, um, we, want him to, uh, we want him to have a healthy lifestyle and, and access to good quality health care and uh, just an, an, uh, an abundance of opportunities for future learning and, uh, and growth and exploration. That's uh, a lot of generalities, but again, it's very limited what we can see from where we stand right now. And our son Matthew, at, at 28 years old, has um, experienced some of the stepping stones that you're experiencing now and wants all the same things. And we want those for him, not just for him, but we want the same things for our daughter who does not have autism. We want her to be happy and healthy. We want her to have choices in her life to be all that she can be. And um, in creating and thinking about Matt's transition, uh, we knew that employment was going to be very important, that some kind of structured learning, structured engagement, having a community um, that allowed him to engage with diverse members of the community in the same way that I never went and wanted Matthew in a classroom of all kids like himself. I wanted him to be able to learn from others, um, and that was very important to us. So right after high school, we created a business for him called Smile Biscotti, which is an acronym for supporting my independent living enterprise. Um, it is the number two sales item of all the passive goods at Pete's Coffee and Tea at Terminal 4 in Sky Harbor. So if you ever go there, um, <laughs> you can also look it up online. But having something productive, we know that that kind of structure after school is, is hugely important. And we weren't, going, we weren't quite sure where he would find that. So we did create a, a business for him and with him. He currently is living um, in a place that we had been dreaming about for some 20 years called First Place, which uh, celebrates neurodiversity, um, people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, people with different abilities, and learning how to live more independently by living independently. And that's what we want for him, is for him to continue to learn, to live, to grow after he leaves our family home. And beyond that, recognizing that we want choices for him. And as its name implies, um, first place may be the first place he lives after leaving our family home, um, but his needs may change, and we want other places for him as well. And we're working on that. So groundbreaking research here. Um, these family members want what any parent wants for their child, a happy life, a productive life, and people to see and places to go. Um, the next part, though, is really getting to where it's different when you have a child with a disability and even a child with ASD, and that is this whole system thing. And so the next question that these folks thought about as they wanted to share their stories with you was um, um, as they took steps, as you as a parent took steps to move forward in your child's transition from school to adulthood, describe the barriers that you encountered and the helpful aspects of the process that helped you move further down the path. Well, the main barriers that I found were it was the other people, the other professionals, the other agencies, and the other schools are my biggest barrier. You know, because as, as qualified and as committed and as good as intended as all of those groups are, and I'm in it because I'm a professional in the VR system, they all have their own limits. But at, the, at the end of the day, this is their job, and that is their business. And they have families to go home to. And given an option, a person will take the path of least resistance. And I have never wanted Ryan to receive the path of least resistance. So some examples, you know, when Ryan was first diagnosed at four, the school psychologist was insistent that Ryan take an intellectual disability diagnosis to get his help because that's where the money was. And Agencies, at the end of the day, they're a business run by their funding rules. And the same with the education, and I'm going to feed into all the researchers in here. In the state of Pennsylvania, on average, there's about 130,000 students that are on an IEP. 
and there's 500 school districts. And the math shows that on average, each school district has 260 students on an IEP. And in my school district, that Ryan's one of that 260. So between that and the students not on an IEP, there's just not enough staff to give the focus and attention that's needed to make sure that it's individualized. Or they'll look at the stressful situation and instead of dealing with how do we teach them coping skills, it'll be let's move them out of that. So you're teaching my son how to flee stress, not to deal with stress. So my wife and I learned a long time ago that we're the only ones that are 100% committed to Ryan's success. And so we needed to be the leaders. And so we needed to look at the opportunity. Ted and I were talking last night about it's up to us sometimes to find those opportunities. In our church, we made sure Ryan was well introduced at a young age. And he slowly got taught how to be an altar server. And now he is the main altar server. He serves by himself. He helps the priest. He does what he needs to do, and he knows how to do it. Ryan was at summer camp. We saw the opportunity there because Ryan was accustomed at summer camp. So we started talking about, what do you think about working here, Ryan, two years before he was going to finish summer camp so that we could start addressing what needed to be addressed so he could apply and he got hired, and this is his second year working at a summer camp. And this summer, he actually worked at two summer camps. So it's all about forward thinking, pre-planning on the parents' part, I feel, and not relying on the professionals that I'm concerned parents are conditioned because at a young age, the professionals come in and say, let me help you take care of your kid. Let me help you educate your kid. Not let me help you be the appropriate advocate for your son so that you take the leadership role not, you, not professional me, parent me, so that we can be the ones that are driving the ship. Ted, I know um, when we were talking on the phone last week, we talked a lot about this specific issue as it relates to equity and families who don't have the resources, maybe single parent families or families who live in poverty. And I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. Sure, sure. So, um, and it is, it is important. Uh, for you in, in the audience to, to recognize this. You know, the three of us who are sitting up here, I mean, we all have our superpowers. Um, and that's probably a, a good part of why we're here. But behind each one of us are a few hundred thousand families who don't, ha who don't have those advantages. And uh, we need solutions. We need solutions for all of them um, that, that, uh, that are scalable and that do not rely on, uh, you know, individual parent heroics. So, uh, you know, as I think about the things that have gotten in our way uh, throughout this journey, one of the big ones, uh, unfortunately, is bad expert advice. Um, when we've reached major uh, turning points in Philip's uh, uh, development, um, you know, there have been a few occasions where we got some spectacularly bad advice that sent us down a blind, uh, a blind alley. Uh, we turned our whole lives upside down, as I'm sure a lot of you who are parents can relate to, to try to do the best thing for him. And when we discovered that it was wrong, it took you know many months and 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 a great deal of money to back out uh, to back out of those blind alleys. We've suffered some reversals that would break and probably bankrupt most families. Um, another thing I would point to is, you know, just the. Um, you know, the indifference of, of our school district. Um, you know, they can be, you know, indifferent at best and, and uh, sometimes obstructionist and, 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 uh, and, and misleading uh, at times uh, at, at worst. And uh, that's been a significant impediment for us. Um, the, um, I would say the sprawl and complexity of the social services system is a big issue. Uh, you know, to provide all of Philip's services and supports. Uh, today, we have to coordinate and communicate and juggle schedules across eight different agencies. Um, and uh, that is a lot for anybody to do. I mean, Philip, you know, he, he needs his own appointment secretary. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're running the advance team for the president, um, you know, to be able to do uh, things that other folks would take for granted. Um, 
Um, Ted, if I can interrupt you for a second. We frequently, we professionals, use the term maze. I think Maria <laughs> used the term fog. I yeah. mean, it's not a maze. A maze implies that there are corners and you, and you know which way to go. Right, yeah, in a maze you can see where the barriers are. Right. Uh, you know, in the, in the fog bank you take one baby step forward at a time. You can't really see what's around you in any direction. And, uh, and, and the best you can do is just, is just try to, to, to muddle through. Um, there, is, there is a significant lack of information. There's a significant amount of misinformation or disinformation in the system, um, which, uh, which, which mis misleads us uh, and wastes a lot of time. Uh, we could have started with Philip's transition process. We're finding out years earlier than we actually did. We could have started with his uh, we could have started with his government benefit programs years earlier than we did had we known um, had we known the rules of the system uh, and if we had had uh, you know uh, if we had had uh, a guide the thing that has been the most helpful for us over the years is other parents um, uh, other parents who have mentored us who have taken the initiative to create outstanding Nonprofit organizations and programs uh, in our in our local area, uh, and uh, uh, and who have provided us with a lot of support. I mean, all the best things in Philip's life started with other parents. Denise, I know you have a lot to tell on, from the other side of the mountain, and much of what you did is very similar. It is similar, and I would echo again. Being third, you get to echo a lot of what's been said before, and think about well, what new am I going to add? Um, in, the case, in, the, in the space of barriers, um, one of them is not being able to see the future that I wanted for our son. It didn't exist. I couldn't go to a place as much as we researched and, and wanted to find in our space the, you know, the first place, the property that we could bring and model back to Arizona and then scale. Um, it didn't exist. And in trying to um, interest folks in this vision and this future, um, it was very difficult to talk to public policy officials um, because they didn't want to get into a disability silo. And then you get into, you know, autism, and, you know, there we go again with all the different flavors and, and points on a spectrum. Um, and so it was very important to us that we figure out a path forward, and there wasn't a single place, but there was a community. And in our case in Phoenix, a very supportive community. So carving a path forward by using existing and leveraging existing resources, leveraging a transportation system, a healthcare system, employers, um, that we don't have to all recreate it and build it. Um, it can be there, but we need to strengthen it. We need to create better on-ramps for how we get into those employment situations, how we can provide that health care so that we can have the same dreams and hopes for our children with autism that we have for our other children. Um, and, and again, I had um, shared just prior to this very important word that we had heard early on, and that was attainable. And that sitting in here today, again, being reminded of all of our lofty goals and the ways we're going to change the world together, it's very important that we pace ourselves because one of the biggest impediments throughout this journey has been wanting to do something for everyone. And it's very important that while we look broadly for the everyone, that we look at, well, where can we start? Where is that low-hanging fruit? Where are the resources going to be? Where are those developing emerging programs that we can develop um, and, and have the data points so that we can really move this forward together? Um, because otherwise, we will stagnate. And I think for some time, because I also had accepted the prescription early on that, you know, that Matthew was only gonna, going to amount to so much, um, that it held us back. So when we can dream, but then when we can phase our dreams, so we know where we want to go. Um, and as I look right at Paul Shattuck and think about our life course outcomes indicators, that we have to find better ways because we cannot afford to continue to have lousy outcomes. And we're spending a lot of money to get lousy outcomes. So how can we redeploy that, those resources and, and work together to find better ways? And also how we leap forward in this next generation with our adults in ways that we didn't do because we were just starting out with our early education, early intervention, and certainly the early diagnoses. But this kind of event today is what's going to bring us together and really help us leap forward. 
We have one last question, and this is the question that really is aspirational for all of us, where we really need to tap into all of your experiences. And Jack, I'm pr particularly interested in your perspective here as both a parent and a professional. Um, imagine that you were to design the perfect service system that was one, supportive of parents and youth with ASD, and two, focused on desired student outcomes. Tell us about that system. What would it have? How would it operate? And how would services be delivered? Who would deliver those services? You know, when thinking about this one, I kind of have two answers. Uh, parent, I would say currently, I am in that situation of where it is the best that it's going to be. It's not perfect. It needs improvement. But because I am the parent taking the lead role in my son's education, transition, life, it is the best because I know I'm 100% committed to Ryan. I, I call the meetings. We have, I don't know if other states call them LEAs, local education administrators. Typically, they're the ones that run the meeting. And early on, I told our LEA that I will be the one running the meetings. So I call the meetings. I schedule the IEPs. We schedule the IEP at the end of the school year, and then I'm scheduling a meeting two weeks into the next school year to meet with that team to review the IEP because they didn't come to it. And then I schedule meetings in between. I maintain communications with the, with the schools. I develop the agendas for the meetings. I tell them what to bring. I want to know how Ryan's doing. I want to know how it compares to the other students and what's our plan to get Ryan as close as we can. And I don't like to hear, just like businesses, don't like to hear, I can't do this. If somebody were to go to Microsoft or somebody was going to go to Autism Speaks and say, this is your mission statement, but I can't do that part, that would be unacceptable in the business world. They would say, what is your plan to get me there? And that's what I usually say to the schools. Just because my son's stressed, don't pull him out of that situation because it's easier. What's the plan? Let's develop and adjust our short-term goals to be able to be solution focused. So I tell parents, and this is where I think parents need the training at young age because transition has to start as soon as you find out. And then parents need to know, ask questions, question answers, stay focused, keep, that, keep, it, keep it moving forward. Change your short-term goals, but not your long-term. You know, keep your child challenged. And one thing that I really want parents to do and what I'm hoping to parents will get will learn, do as much as you can for your child. Because the more you do socially for your child means the less the school has to do socially and then they can educate your child. Because when you don't do things at home, then the school is going to start to put them in socialization programs and they got to pull them from somewhere and that's going to be academics. Because every year you miss is one more year your kid falls behind. And that's been my focus in that regards. So, and parents need to be careful not to go down the rabbit hole because it's so easy for us to go down that rabbit hole. I still do it. So my three big words for a parent is responsibility, accountability, and opportunity. If you give your child responsibility and you hold them accountable to that responsibility, they will get opportunities when they get older. So as a professional, I was at Seattle. I had a great opportunity to speak at the Autism at Work in, in Seattle. And what I told everybody there was to the employers, don't let VR tell you what the system will look like. And that's what I wanted to follow up with you on. The parents and the employers need to be telling VR what the expectation is and let us adjust to you because that's what VR is here for. It is to work with families and employers on the needs of individuals with disabilities to overcome barriers, not the other way around. We'll tell you what the requirements are at that moment, but we need to know what you want. So we can go back to the legislators and say. Go ahead, Jack. Sure. So um, at some level, this is so simple. Uh, if, you know, what system of fairness would we design if we could not know in advance what our position in society would be or what position our children uh, would have would have in society you would want it to be you would want it to be broadly inclusive 
you would want it to be family driven um, because because it, at the end of the day it does it does always fall back on us. Uh, you would want it to be flexible to accommodate the the broad range of of uh, situation of, of individuals within within the spectrum, and you want and you want it to be generous. Um, one of the th things I think you 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 asked about earlier, um, you know, when we spoke last week, is you know the current platform for providing a lot of these services is an anti-poverty platform, and with that comes a lot of baggage. I mean, going all the way back to the '70s and '80s when we were you know, as a society, you know, vilifying, you know, welfare, welfare mothers and, and uh, you know, attacking waste, fraud, and abuse in the system. That is still with us today. Um, and just as one example, you know, Philip now has an opportunity to get paid a, a training wage, a minimum, a minimum wage for his um, worksite uh, internships uh, that's paid for by our uh, our OPWDD in New York, but in order to qualify for that program, he has to be fingerprinted. So come on, really? Uh, I, I think that we need to pay attention to the plight um, of providers as well in this system. The the agency system that we have, at least in in, in our area, is badly broken. Um, providers, uh, especially. Uh, uh, especially in the later years, they're, they are itinerant hourly workers who are going from house to house. They don't get paid for their travel time. They don't get paid for their they don't get paid for their expenses. They're working part time. They get no benefits. Um, when that is the model of employment that we uh, force upon the people that we are entrusting with the future of our kids, we're not going to get good results from that. So. Um, uh, I think that it is incredibly important that we come up with uh, empowerment and supports and protections for parents and others who are taking on the burdens that would otherwise fall to the uh, fall to the state. Um, one of the things that has been incredibly valuable to us in our journey has been parent education, parent training, because you know, as as everybody has said. Uh, uh, you know, we have to be the informed, educated consumers of all of these services, and we have to, you know, we have to root out the, um, uh, the, the bad experts and the bad providers, and we have to be able to be hands-on with our kids because, you know, school is 180 days a year, right? They're with us more hours of the day and more days out of the year than they're, than they're in school, and so we've got the best chance to be able to, uh, to to make a positive impact, and we can only do that um, with that training and support. Um, and uh, finally, I would just say that we need to make the entire system much more transparent than it is today. Um, we don't have benchmarks. We don't have uh, you know we don't have uh, you know we don't have performance indicators. Uh, that are visible to us. We don't know how we stack up against what's going on in other states or other regions. It's just impossible for us to uh, to tell. We have no way of knowing if the si if the system is applying, uh, you know, resources and supports in a way that is in a way that is uh, equitable, uh, because it's not visible to us. So those are just some of the things I would point to. Excellent. And Denise, all really great specifics. Um, let me try this for you. What if we together built the um, transition superhighway? Now let's everyone consider, what, what's a highway? A highway is something that you get on, you have multiple on-ramps and multiple off-ramps, and you have a destination. But once you get to your destination, maybe you wanna go a little bit further. So think about those destinations as our life course outcomes. And during a life, you're gonna come on and off the superhighway. Now, as a parent, I'm going to drive my own vehicle, but Matthew would be in one of those driverless vehicles I was just talking about in the women's ladies' room. Um, and so you think about all the different ways we can get to where we're going. And, you know, when you're on a highway, there are rules of the road. You, you have to follow. You have to signal. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you're not supposed to change without looking. And there are some HOV lanes, right, where we can go a little bit faster. Um, but think about the lanes of a highway that would represent a public sector, 
a private sector, a nonprofit sector, and a philanthropic sector. Now that philanthropic sector, well, they've afforded us at first place an opportunity to be innovative, to use that social capital, to experiment, make some mistakes. Um, we know that the private sector, if we're really gonna get going in this space, they're gonna take it on, just like we see the you know, venture capital going after the early intervention now because we have you know, outcomes and we have funding streams and so venture capital's after that. Well, if we wanna get going in the home and community options space, we need the, you know, the private sector behind us and we need communities behind us too. We know that public sector has been there always in our schools and, and places where we need supports in the home and nonprofits like Autism Speaks here today, or SARC or First Place, or many of you, they can bring it all together, um, and they can be that lane. You know, they, they can bring all those segments together. So, so think about, you know, in terms of that that future, um, that future that that isn't just one system. You know, we have to be able to cross systems and cross lanes because it's going to take all of us moving this forward. And and where I believe Matt. Um, wants to go in the next 10 years or where he could go may look very different if he has health um, or other challenge issues. And, and so, um, you know, we're, we can only see as far as perhaps, you know, that sign that says 326 miles and you've arrived, but then we're going to have a new destination. And I want to make sure it's important to us um, as being one of the older people on the group that it's not a closed system. It, it, we've got to have more, multiple on-ramps and on-ramps, and that's really all of us in the room today. I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much um, for for all of you. We're we're looking at three heroic parents, and we really appreciate your sharing your stories with us, and really helping us consider um, the perspective of how do we make it better for the folks who are really the sustainable forces in their children's lives. So thank you very much. Please join me. Thank you so much, Carol, and uh, and the parents that uh, spoke to us. It was the perfect setup for this session, um, and it couldn't have been planned better. I'm going to take some time to uh, talk a bit more about the complexity of the system and try to break that down. I'm Thomas Golden. I'm the executive director of the Kaylee C. Yang and Hockey Tan Institute on Employment and Disability in the ILR School at Cornell and a professor of disability studies there. And um, I had the wonderful opportunity of doing um, some complexity leadership training with some Fortune 500 companies here several months ago. And at the end of the presentation, where I showed this video um, at the end, to remind them of the nuances of what it means to be a complex adaptive system, a, a director, or excuse me, vice president of human capital came up to me from a Fortune 100 company in tears. And he said, oh my god, that's me. I'm like, it's you, I don't, I don't understand. And he went on to explain that he is the parent of a young man with autism. And he goes, it's how my wife and I feel at the end of every academic year. He goes, we go in feeling like we've got everything pulled together and we're ready to go. But by the time it's all said and done, we are that last little fish that gets gobbled up by the, by the yellowfin tuna. And sadly, this is a perfect illustration of what I think our systems do to the individuals that are trying to benefit from the services that we provide and that we offer. And what I want to do today with you, Arun, one would hope that I could figure this out at this point. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is to look at what these complexities are, but we're going to do it through um, looking at complex systems. Um, in systems theory, because I think it provides us a different vantage point to look at something that we can bring down to a very human type of experience. And what I'm hoping that we'll do is expose some of the voids that currently exist in our domestic uh, disability policy framework as it relates to transition for youth with disabilities, and then explore some strategies that we identified through the National Promise demonstration um, to actually maybe talk about some potential solutions that we can look at. So let's talk about complexity theory. This is a really simple way of illustrating what the video illustrated. And that was that each of those 
ancha letters, as they called them, um, represent that little person in the green. Each individual fish is a complex adaptive system that's constantly taking information in from its environment, right? And trying to make decisions about what is my action going to be in regard to that. And those things come in from the external environment. And I make a decision based on that. Maybe I'm gonna move left because that thing coming in from the outside, the external environment's a big yellow tuna, right? And so I'm gonna move left, hopefully get out of its way. Now, there's the potential that there's gonna be a good reaction to that. It's gonna achieve, that behavior is gonna achieve the desired outcome. And that means that I'm gonna amplify that behavior, right? I'm gonna to continue to behave that way because that's going to ensure my sustainability um, as an organism, right? As a complex adaptive system. The other thing that can happen though is there's another complex adaptive system, another little Ancheletta right next to me, and they go to do the same thing, but they go the other way and they get chomped, right? I take in information from that and I say, oh, I definitely want to kind of dampen that type of response because that didn't end well for that Ancheletta, right? And so as complex adaptive systems, it's, it's about how we constantly can be sizing up what's going on in the environment around us, those forces that are being exerted. And you heard the parents talk beautifully about the forces that were exerted in their life. The fingerprinting, where's Ted? He was talking about the fingerprinting. That needs, those are those environmental forces that exert on us, those different disability standards. One of them talked about their child intersecting eight different programs, right? Each of those programs represents probably likely different eligibility criteria, different rules and regulations that they have to follow. Those are all of those environmental things that they're constantly having to adapt and to react to. So as we think about transition, though, we think about some of the problems that we've been talking about along, along this morning, um, it, it emerges, what emerges from that is, I think it was Denise was talking about, oh, we need the highway to not be closed, we need it to be open. Well, prior to us taking complex adaptive systems theory and applying it to organizations, it used to only live in the realm of, of science, right? Um, and prior to that, we only thought of our systems as either open or closed, right? And so Denise was arguing for open. That means that they're going to be taking information in, but that necessarily doesn't sustain an organism either because you, do, A, maybe don't do anything with the information you're taking in, or B, you don't put something back out to the external environment to potentially change that as well. And so we know that open systems didn't necessarily translate to long-term sustainability either. The other option, which is even worse, is to operate as a closed system, where we just continue to operate in isolation of those things that are going on around us, and, we're, and we see some of those things in the organizations that we work with, maybe organizations that um, choose to no longer take information in and maybe respond to trends or innovations that are coming along, and they just decide, I'm going to continue to do what I'm going to do, right? And what happens to them? We know that over time, they die if they don't figure out, or entropy sets into the system as a whole. And so complex adaptive systems, as we're taking a look at the various systems that youth that are transitioning have to intersect with, it's critical for us to do it through that complex adaptive systems eye, if you will, or, or that lens. And so as we think about transition potentially as a complex adaptive system that's made up of lots of complex adaptive systems. That's the beauty of this model, right? We're just a bunch of casses bumping into one another all over the place. And we all have different environments that we work in, different things that we have to respond to. What we know about transition, and you've heard it this morning articulated, is that there's multiplicity of agency. What do I mean by that? I mean, there's lots of freaking stakeholders, right? That we're having to balance, that we're having to consider, that we're having to understand their languages, their acronyms, right? And so each of those different um, entities that make up the transition process from the young person with a disability, their family, the local school district, their teacher, their occupational therapist, their speech therapist, their psychologist, their neuropsychologist, whatever it might be, the community provider that they're potentially working with, the residential program they're potentially working with, the employment provider they're potentially working with. Each of those agency, right, have their own agency and thus are a complex adaptive system unto themselves. And so it just takes one of them to not operate as a cast for the system to go a bit haywire, right? Um, and to not work. We also know that there's this ever-changing external environment, and we make an assumption that, um, 
that like a stone thrown into the water, that there will be ripples, right, that are going to impact all the other areas. And we know that that's not true with some of the current policy changes that I'm going to get into a little bit later. We also see that there's limited opportunity for innovation. Um, and what I mean by that is Eric and I were talking a little bit that, you know, unless it comes down from on high, and on high I don't mean God, I mean above him, the state ed department, right? <laughs> if it doesn't come from them, or the, the US DOE, if it doesn't come from them, it's not going to the state, it's not going to the local school district, and it's not impacting the classroom, right? Somehow we have to think through how do we create policies that allow for innovations to emerge. We also have these competing institutional templates that are out there that really pose a barrier to us being an effective complex adaptive system for the youth that we're trying to serve because we just don't get rid of old policy in the United States. We let it linger and fester like a cold sore, right? Um, and so we have in our group this morning, they were talking about uh, the ADA. You know, it's something that we're already taking for granted, right? It was like, oh yeah, we have the ADA, we have civil rights. We didn't have that, right, back in the day. But they were talking about that as a piece of civil rights legislation that's important. At the same time, Caffeine Andrew, I know he's here somewhere, was actually talking about 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now you talk about a horrific dichotomy in policy, right? You have a piece of policy that segregates and pays people subminimum wage, and at the same time over here you have something that's supporting their civil rights, their integration, and their rights to community citizenship. These competing institutional templates do more to harm us in trying to affect institutional change for transition. And then sadly, most of our systems, all of those different stakeholders that I was mentioning before, many of them are still operating as closed um, and or open systems. They don't see themselves as needing to respond to some of the environmental drivers or forces that we've been talking about already this morning. And so as you think about balancing agency and transition, um, and I, I'm doing this from a, a, a perspective of seeing it as kind of a, a seesaw, right? That um, what we have are the supply side and the demand side, right? Um, that being on the supply side, you know, people with disabilities and or targeted entities. On the other side of that, we have the um, actual demand side. So what is it that we're trying to achieve? Is it an employer? Um, is it community living? What might that be? And then some sort of catalyst between the two. We often think of those as schools, service providers that help to make those things come to fruition for us. And then they all balance very precariously on what? policy, right? Because practice flows from policy. And so to get a balance um, of the agency in the transition process for us, it requires lots of alignment that currently we don't see. Um, and it's another interesting area for research is where is the lack of balance and what is it that we need to be tweaking so that as we try to manage this complexity to thread this needle, um, we can get our hands around that. Um, I stole a quote <laughs> from one of our colleagues here today who, who stated that untimely transition planning, complex adult service systems, and lack of job opportunities are only a few of the factors that influence the post-school success of youth with ASD. Just those, right? Like, that's enough, right? When we think about it, it's a bit overwhelming. But it's a powerful statement because those are all things that we know aren't currently happening for the population of youth that we're trying to thread the needle for. So let's take some time to talk about our current domestic systemic framework that we have in the US right now. And so we're gonna take a little bit of time to talk about WIOA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, IDEA. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because the groups this morning did a great job um, of, of actually talking us through what that is. Medicaid, Social Security Act, you've heard people talk about that quite a bit this morning as well. And then some other federal and state partnerships. And so you know that Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act is broken into two pieces, right? Title I, which is focusing on America's job centers, um, and those being the things that kind of are universally designed for all Americans to be able to access. And what we've seen with the implementation of WIOA is this comprehensive youth employment program for serving eligible youth between the ages of 14 to 24, right? Now, what's interesting about the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act is, is many people don't see it for the profound piece of legislation it is. Um, and that is, I think for the first time in our country's domestic disability policy framework, Congress drew a line in the sand and said, you know what? 
this is Tom Golden's school of thought, not Congress's, so don't go tell them this. Um, I think that what they were saying was, we're drawing a line in the sand because you know what, I don't know that we can do anything with adults more than we are. I think there's this learned helplessness that we're not moving the needle, but there sure has been a brilliant body of research out there from people like Mazzotti et al. Um, who are telling us there are some things that we know if we invest money in it now, it's gonna have huge dividends for us later on. And so they drew a line in the sand and said, we are gonna shift and we're gonna put our money where our mouth is. It's gonna be all about youth. And so they did that in Title I with the allocation of resources that actually have to be expended on the youth population. And as well on Title IV, as you look at 15% of their federal allotment for the State Voc Rehab Program has to be set aside for pre-employment transitions services in addition to that you know that they closed the front door to sub minimum wage employment for youth and at the same time opened the door to supported employment by saying guess what now 50% of your supported employment federal allotment has to go to serving youth with the most significant disabilities and so on the voc rehab side we saw a huge investment of capital invested in ensuring that youth are going to have access to some of those predictor services that we know are going to lead to post school success for youth. In addition to that, there are some other services and supports that were part of this, such as um, social communication in post-secondary environments and social communication in employment that we saw specifically targeted for individuals with ASD. And, and the jury's out as to what's going to happen in state voc rehabs with those services and how they're going to do it. But you see this shift taking place. The challenge with this is that up to this point, State vocation rehabilitation, it, and this is a gross overgeneralization, so I apologize to the state voc rehabs that are here that might be a little bit more contemporary. Um, state voc rehab was primarily an adult agency. It was an adult service agency. They had a network of adult service providers that actually delivered the work, did the placement services, placed people in jobs, and sadly, Someone thought that just changing the legislation and the priority in the legislation meant that state voc rehabs were going to become really good at working with kids as young as age 14, right? Even though nobody bothered to provide training to anybody, and nobody bothered to even network or provide training to those providers that actually do a bunch of the legwork for state voc rehab. And so there's this potential train wreck, which I'm gonna illustrate for you much more beautifully a little bit later on in my presentation, that's happening as a result of this simple shift that perhaps I'm worried we didn't think through well enough about how we needed to prepare the system to respond to these priorities. At the same time, you have Section 504. So we've spent a lot of time today focusing on those kids with ASD that are part of special ed under IDA, but guess what? There are a lot of kids that are also under Section 504. And then I've talked to parents that are saying, my kid is neither, and I don't want them to be. What do we do about that, right? And so not everybody is gonna intersect with the special education system. And what we know about 504 is that a student's gonna to have to be qualified to access the 504 plan. And there's no assurance, right? Because they're not federally required to ensure that those students have a transition plan, right? Now, some states, like New York State, have come out with policy directives that students that are on 504 should have a transition plan. I don't know the extent to which they're the rule and not the exception <laughs> to the rule. But 504 is out there, and I'm not for sure that kids are duly and equitably protected when it comes to transition under 504 and an assurance that they're going to have access to high quality uh, transition planning. I'm not gonna take a lot of time to talk about IDEA. I thought the group today did a really good job of talking about what the purpose of it is um, and the transition mandates that are a part of that. And so to save time, I'm gonna kind of gloss over it. But one of the things that we do know, and we talked about this in, in Val's breakout group this morning around employment was we talked about and celebrated a little bit um, the power of work-based learning is a predictor. You know, we're up to 20 predictors of things that we know lead to some post-school success, and we know that work-based learning is one of them, right? The challenge is that when I look at the literature, I'm not seeing anything clear and convincing about youth with ASD, right? I look at some of those studies and the stuff that came out of the NTAC, the National Technical Assistance Center, the outlook was pretty bleak on the sample of students with ASD that were represented in many of those studies. So while I celebrate it, woohoo! I'm also, eh, for this population, I don't know that we've done the work that we need to do 
to really assure that it is. However, my good friend Carol Shaw at VCU, she's still here, shared a study with me, and I was so excited because I'm like, Carol, I need to wrap up the work-based learning thing with something good. She goes, well, we're just finishing up a study, and it's a great study that actually took a look at um, Project Search um, that they had done at VCU. And the really profound thing about this, and this is the skinny of the story, I'm not going to go into the whole research, but what they found was that students with ASD that actually engaged in Project Search, right, there was this, it had an impact on other areas of their life, including lifelong learning. The power of that is that when you contrast it to the high school control group that didn't get it, they fared better, right? And so the story it tells is academics isn't enough. In and of itself, academics isn't enough. That when it's paired with work-based learning, something like Project Search, we see a much better outcome for youth and a much stronger commitment to enhancement in other areas of their life, as well as lifelong learning. So stay tuned, we need more work in this area. Then of course there's Medicaid, right? <laughs> it's a state administered program, so what does that mean? You cross the state border and it's a whole new game, right? The rules, while they are federal in nature, this is a state administered program, and so not all of our waiver programs are created equal. Let's just face it, I was listening to, where's my Pennsylvania person from my group? There you are, they're talking about their lovely waiver program that they have in Pennsylvania, and I'm just kind of getting grumpy because I'm like, oh, we don't have that in New York. You know, employment isn't a centerpiece of that, despite all of our best employment first initiatives. And so we're really seeing some voids in some of the waiver programs when it comes to promoting employment and really supporting effective transition outcomes for youth. Then we have the Social Security Act. This is another part of our domestic disability framework that we need to consider when we think about the complexity. You heard, um, now the researchers are all running together. I think it was Eric. Eric was talking this morning about, I think it was one in four individuals with ASD live in poverty. Was it you? Thank you. <laughs> I remembered something, <laughs> just because it illustrated what I wanted to talk about. That's why I remembered it. But it's a high percentage of people living in poverty. And that, no, it's one in five live in a household in poverty, and then one in four receive some sort of a means-tested benefit. That's what we're talking about here, supplemental security income. We know from the PROMISE demonstration that about one in five of the individuals in that random assignment were individuals with autism. That's a high prevalence of individuals with autism in that population and in that group. And what we know is the complexity of those programs, be it they're on the children's SSI program or the adult SSI program, because there's a different disability standard, or they're getting benefits as a disabled adult child under the parent, um, having paid into the Title II system, it's complicated at best. But we do know that there are some special work incentives if you can find somebody to tell you about them that understands them and can give you good information that can actually help you develop a pathway to employment um, that doesn't jeopardize your benefits or provides a much more gradual ramp in to employment as you're trying um, your hand at work. But it's a complicated system that many parents spend years getting their children eligible for and then to have them maybe potentially put it at risk is dangerous. And then this is coupled by the fact that we have a provider network um, that doesn't want to put their benefits at risk either and so they underemploy these people, right? You can't look at the national VR data and tell me that every single person served by VR that gets SSI or DI just wants to work right under that SGA cliff, right? That That's not a thing. That's That's a third party influencer at play there, right? And so this adds some significant complexity to the equation. At the same time, we have this thing called the Ticket to Work Act. I haven't heard anybody talk about that yet, but that's probably because it's only for people 18 to 64 that have been redetermined to meet the adult disability standard for SSI. But the Ticket to Work program offers another avenue or pathway to employment for people that may not need specialized services and supports or don't want to take the traditional routes to getting employment like state voc rehab or the state DD agencies. But what we know about the ticket to work is that for transition age youth that have not been redetermined, it's not an option yet for them. 
Then there are other state and federal systems that we're not going to take a lot of time to get into because they're different based on every state, but those would be the DDID systems as well as the mental health systems that are out there. And, and what we see and what we experience on a regular basis, regardless of the state that we're in, is that uh, disability standards are different. And often youth coming out of our school systems um, that have been classified with ED is a label, if you will, doesn't translate well to the adult system that's using different criteria. And so there are really some challenges that are being faced. Also, some of the state DD agencies are not willing to provide services to youth under certain age limits, right? And so that also becomes problematic and another complexity that families are having to manage. And so for us, I, I thought the best way to maybe illustrate, so what does this all look like? when you go to put it into practice, right? All of these different systems, and I'm sure probably the parents that are sitting here going, yep, check, did that program, check, tried to do that program too. But let's talk about it through the lens of promise. And um, Kelly Crane and, and my colleague from um, Cornell um, are here, um, and they were part of the promise demonstration. But promise, um, and again, I just want to illustrate saying that, that I do think this is relevant to our conversation today, given the high prevalence of youth with ASD that were part of this demonstration. While we've not seen anybody yet tear the data apart, although stay tuned, because I think, Hassan, your poster session might do that. Yes, it does. Um, tears apart the ASD piece to kind of uh, separate out that population of people to take a look at it. But PROMISE was a federal research demonstration that was a partnership between the U.S. Department of Education, the Department of Labor, the Social Security Administration, and Health and Human Services. They contracted for an external evaluation through Mathematica Policy Research, which you heard Arun talk about earlier, that they will be doing some more longitudinal evaluation over the next several years to look at the outcomes of these youth. And then there were six projects that were funded to actually implement it, and then AUCD, the, I don't know what that acronym stands for, so I'm not going to stumble over it. They were the National Technical Assistance Center. The states that you can see represented here that were part of that, um, Aspire was a multi-state demonstration site, just because it took that many states to round up enough people in that low population area to be able uh, to meet the enrollment requirements for the project. And the purpose of it was to improve the provision and coordination of services and supports for SSI recipients who were children and their families to enable them to achieve improved employment outcomes as well as educational attainment and long-term reduction in the Social Security program. Um, notice that families are a really big part of this. This is the first, I believe, national research demonstration that was just not recipient-centered. Um, it was family-centered because somebody, reading some research somewhere, realized that families held the key to transition, right? And so they wanted to see whether or not that could be impacted. And so there were specific requirements for the demonstrations that they had to have certain state partners on board. These systems that, we ta that I just talked about all were required partners um, to be on board with this. It targeted 14 to 16 year old youth who were child SSI recipients. And there were required services that were to be provided. Interestingly enough, um, all of them had a fair amount of research that was out there to support that there was some level of evidence base that we knew that these services led to better post-school outcomes. Um, but in addition to that, there was a requirement for case management. And we're going to talk more about what that was and why we thought that was important. And so when we implemented in 2013, um, there was a growing body of literature that said that these evidence-based practices should work. They should produce the outcomes you want, package them together, you're only going to up the ante and, and the potential positive outcome from that. Uh, we also uh, knew, knew from research that led up to this through the 90s and the 2000s, we had a growing trajectory of youth enrolling in the SSI program. I think we've curbed that the last decade, and we're seeing that begin to go back down again. But there was a huge increase in the trajectory of SSI applications. This was all pre-WIOA. Um, um, passage, and so the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act had not been passed yet at this point, um, and so nobody in the VR program was working with youth as young as the age of 14. Um, it, we also had this complexity that we've been talking about 
um, already. And so we knew that there were some pretty significant systems challenges that we were going to have to face. Um, the primary one being that we knew that there were hugely disparate. So when you take the apple barrel, if you will, of disability, um, we recognize that there are different statuses of people in there, right? Or different um, layers of people that get better outcomes, though they get not good outcomes, right? SSI and DI are toward the bottom of the apple barrel, if you will. That's not a research citation of any sort, but that's where they were, right? They had hugely disparate employment outcomes when compared to the rest of the disabled population. And we knew that there was this composite picture that once youth got on the rolls, they rarely got off from it, they rarely completed school, they typically didn't work or participate in voc rehab, and they were less likely to be integrated and receive transition services and supports. Now, interestingly enough, there was also a composite picture of the family that was just as disparate, right? We knew that those families typically had more than one person with a disability in the family. There was low educational achievement, low financial literacy, um, multi-generational reliance on the public entitlements itself, and a lack of information to increase their self-sufficiency. And so the composite picture for this population and their families wasn't good. And so this intervention was targeted to not just give the youth more of a leg up, but also to look at what can we do to increase the outlook for these families. What we knew going into this um, was that we took a baseline of, so how was VR? Like, I mean, that's a system that we know works with a lot of SSI and DI beneficiaries. How were they doing as a system to meet the needs of this population? And looking at their administrative data from 2015 to 2016, we knew that from their caseload data that about one in five of the uh, people that they served with SSI uh, were youth. Of those, um, that were SSI youth in the system, only one in four were achieving a successful employment outcome. That's, that's pretty bad. 25% of the youth that they were working with who had SSI were having a positive outcome. Of those that got the positive outcome, three quarters went into competitive integrated employment, and then, about two thirds went into competitive integrated employment, the other third went into supported employment. So the system's outlook, even with Voc Rehab, was not real well. I don't know that Voc Rehab had figured out a silver bullet how to really work effectively with this population. And now keep in mind, this is a pre-WIOA environment. I get that, right? But what it tells us is this is a system that prior to WIOA wasn't doing a great job with producing better outcomes for this population. So we were real pleased that a couple of the promised demonstrations were VR-centric models that were based in the Voc Rehab Agency. Um, and so some of the other systems challenges that we'd be remiss not to talk about is realizing that from the family perspective that there were real challenges that they faced. And what we know from the challenges that they faced um, was that they were inundated with the systems they were working with. Because these were households that lived in poverty, they were um, really requiring that benefit check and there was a fair amount of fear about losing that. And we learned really quickly over the course of the project that Maslow's hierarchy applies here, right? And part of the challenge of this for us from a transition systems perspective is that when we think about transition services and supports, they are to the person, right? Eligibility for IDEA, for voc rehab, for Medicaid, for Social Security, for all those systems that we talked about were for who? The individual with the disability or that student with the disability. It has nothing to do with the family member, but we know that many of the challenges that were faced and the barriers that were faced was that families were not ready for the services and supports that we had to offer them because of where they were on Maslow's hierarchy. Many of them weren't pay, able to pay the rent. They couldn't pay the electric. Their electric was going to be shut off. They had to move. There were immigration issues. The list went on and on of crisis situations that were the things that we needed to navigate through case management and family coaching that were most essential to readying, readying this population of youth and their families to take advantage of the services and supports that we have to offer. Now, the really interesting part of the Promise Intervention Services, there is nothing that we offer Offered beyond case management, truly, that's not already a part of our domestic disability policy framework. They can access pre-ETS now, 
right? They can access post-secondary education supports. They can access the majority of services that we've provided. The thing that's not available for them is the case management and family coaching that addresses these areas which prove to be the predominant barrier to them being able to take advantage of, engage in, and benefit from the services and supports that were being offered. At the same time, we did an interesting study early on because we found that many of our service providers that were a part of our New York State Promise demonstration actually didn't want to do it anymore. They backed out. That's disturbing, right? Like, this is an important population of people. WIOA has just been authorized. We know that there's going to be a huge infusion of dollars for youth services. What do you mean you don't want to work and you don't want to provide services? And so we did a study to really try to understand, do they understand what essential services and support are to support a youth career development employment, and then how feasible is it for them to do that? And so we asked them to be effective in providing career um, and uh, development and employment services for students and youth with disabilities as well as out of school youth. We asked them um, to tell us what they feel they need to know, do, or be able to do, or be aware of. To, to do this successfully. And what it created was this interesting conceptual map that they clearly had the knowledge of what needed to be done, right? They named the predictors almost verbatim in the responses in the study, right? They knew what needed to be done. They just weren't doing it. And we called that a knowing doing gap, right? When we know it needs to be done, but we're not gonna do it. And then it comes down to why aren't you gonna do it? Well, maybe I can't, I won't, or I don't know how. Right? And so this topic that we're talking about training, training in and of itself, I'll tell you right now, isn't your silver bullet to getting the transition beast to move a little bit. Because these people knew it. They had the knowledge. They weren't putting it into practice for whatever reason. And a big part of that we identified is through the study, we think anyways, was this competing institutional template. They did not see themselves all of the New York State employment service providers that we did this with saw themselves as their primary identity was being an adult service provider, not a youth service provider. It's a competing institutional template. They didn't want to provide services after three o'clock in the afternoon, right? It's not how they staffed up. It's not how they knew how to do it. They didn't have transportation pieces that were in play. They didn't know what the transition processes were with school districts and how to intersect with that well. And so they were really challenged as a system as a whole. I would say that they were operating as a closed system. They had a real inability, at least in New York State, and it's, it's probably one of my biggest fears is we're taking a look at how successful we're going to be with the rollout of WIO is, I don't think it's just New York State that's struggling with this issue. I think that it's probably many states. So we do know that there were some great outcomes as a result of Promise, despite how negative, I'm sounding awfully negative and I don't mean to. Um, there is a really good story here, right? Once we worked through the systems challenges and obstacles and we got providers on board that work, that could bridge that knowing doing gap, uh, we know that as a result of the Promise set of interventions that were done, and this is from the National Press Club presentation that we had done, that we had decreased high school dropout rates, resulting in improved high school retention and graduation. We had increased access to vocational rehabilitation services, as well as increased engagement in paid and unpaid work experiences and other transition activities, and increased employment in post-secondary education following graduation. So we moved all the needles that I think the feds were expecting were going to be able to be moved as a result of this, um, but we still are faced with some real challenges. Um, and I'm just gonna do a time check. I have five minutes, I'm told. So some of the challenges that we still um, are needing to face is this focus on academic um, enhancement in graduation attainment, right? And so somewhere along the line, people said, um, academics are the most important. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that's not true. Uh, Carol's research would say, I think a little bit otherwise, that there, it's critical for the population that we're talking about that we're also providing access to work-based learning. That's an integration of academics and the curriculum in a functional, authentic environment. Um, we also were um, really challenged by some of the limitations in the local school districts to partner well. 
Um, and, and I'll illustrate that for you. When WIOA passed, uh, you know, IDEA still has not been reauthorized, right? So I'm sitting and I'm doing some training with a bunch of state uh, special ed folk, and I bring up the fact that in our state, I knew of four school districts that were contracting with local community rehab programs for subminimum wage employment, which when WIOA passed was outlawed, right? It's, you're not allowed to do that anymore. I said, so what are you gonna do about that? And they said, well, until IDEA is reauthorized, it's not our problem, right? That's a problem, right? We have, again, within our disability policy framework, we have laws that work in opposition to one another. I loved Arun's thing that he started today with that showed unintended consequences. That's what we're talking about. We pass a piece of legislation, but we don't align all the other pieces of the puzzle together. That's a huge thing that we need to address before we leave here is what's not aligned. I mean, even if we could identify what's not aligned and how do we align that, that's a good first step for us to think about. Uh, we also found lots of uh, challenges working with promised families. It's about trust. Um, it's about building rapport. It's about meeting their basic needs so that they can then move up Maslow's hierarchy to where they're focusing on self-development, right? That's the sweet spot. That's when we actually were able to provide services to them. But the crisis intervention stuff that happened had to happen before, um, if we had not had intensive case management as part of that, it would not have occurred for them. And so some gap lessons that we learned from this is that we know that it's important um, that both SSI youth and families have access to case management. It's, it's essential. It became the cornerstone of the services that we provided. Now, here's the sad part of that, is that we currently do not have in our domestic policy landscape a piece of legislation that addresses this. Because again, all services and supports flow specifically to the individual. Although somebody told me, Mary, I'm gonna have to check this. Mary Morningstar might know about this. Somebody told me that there's this thing called a family intervention plan that families get prior to age three under IDEA. Yeah, so you all know. So this is the smart table up here. They all know that. <laughs> But, but again, right, so somebody told me that. I'm like, oh, I've got to learn more about that because why do we stop that at age three? Dear heavens, right? If it works for kids up to age three, that could be a potential policy solution then is part of transition planning because what, what parents told us through focus groups we did was that the most valuable thing that they got was having another parent that could coach them and lead them through these processes. Not so different from what our parents here were telling us. And so we know that that's critical. We also know that we need to see a better crosswalk between Title I and Title IV of WIOA, we still see those systems operating in isolation in most cases. There is a state back here at my table that's doing a great job of integrating that. Um, but we, we also know that, that there has to be some solutions that are developed um, toward, uh, toward that end. And Arun, I think, you know, many of these things we've kind of already talked about. I, I want to save you the time that you need, but, uh, you know, I think coming out of it, the long story is youth and family-centered case management supports are most critical for this population. And I, I can't help but think that there are other populations that would benefit um, as well as from, uh, from those supports. So Arun, I'm going to turn it to you.